Like the flower needs the sun that shines. Like the river needs the rain. Like the sparrow loves the summer sky. My love for you, Lord, is still the same. Like a mother loves her baby's sigh. Like the ocean loves the shore. Like the heavens need the stars at night. My love for you, Lord, is even more. Lord, I love you with every little breath I'm sure. Lord, I love you completely and forevermore. Number seven ministries. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed. Number seven ministries. I love you with every little breath I'm sure. Lord, I love you. Welcome to Number Seven Ministries Christian Outreach. Today's sermon is called Seven Fear Factors. If we take the Word of God and we take it out of its context, what we do is like we're messing with the blueprints of a construction project for a house. If you go into a construction project or a construction zone, you can often find blueprints. And if you take those blueprints and you don't like the way they look, for whatever reason, you just you don't like black lines for some reason. So then you scratch out the black lines and you make them red lines. Well, how do you know that those black lines, they may represent something. Black lines might be symbolic for putting a door somewhere or putting a, uh, a, a drywall somewhere. So we can't mess with the blueprints. If we change one single thing with the blueprints, we might have to change the entire thing. And this is what folks do with the Word of God. They will change it, and then once they change one scripture, they're going to have to change the whole entire thing. Because the Word of God is complete in itself. This is why the Bible says don't add to or don't take from it. Because it's perfect. And the Bible also says along those lines, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Okay, so... We're going to go into um, different explanations of bad fear and good fear. Number one, bad fear factor is afraid God will not provide. This is a negative fear. This is an evil fear. This is a bad fear. In, 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 in Hebrew, there's a word for the Lord called Jehovah Jireh, which calls God our provider. And the devil always is trying to attack who God is. And what he does is try to trick us into thinking that God is going to neglect us. Maybe he'll take care of everyone else, but he'll pass me by and he won't provide for us. The devil will attack God's children even after they're saved, even after they're born again, even after they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and he will try to tell them that God is not going to provide for them, and then the Christian will be, begin to become fearful in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25. The Bible says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and body more than remnant? Now, this is the thing. The devil will literally attack us, Christians. He don't even, a lot of times, he leaves the unsaved folks alone. And he tries to attack the born again, the church. Satan hates Jesus. Satan hates Jesus. And if we're Christians and we're following Jesus, guess what? He hates us too. And he will try to torment us. 
by thoughts of saying, we're going to starve to death. We're going to run out of money. We're going to be homeless. We're not going to have clothes. He'll give us, he'll, all of us these thoughts. And now let me tell you this. Satan doesn't care how much money we have or don't have. Satan does this to rich folks. You have people that have millions of dollars. And they still would call themselves poor because they would compare themselves to people who have billions of dollars. Then you have billions of billionaires who would call themselves poor. And these folks live in fear and torment, always worried about what's going to happen. And God doesn't want us to be living in torment. The Bible says that love casts out fear. For some of you who are TV fans, there was a show called The Fear Factor. And the fear factor, there was a host that would get these groups of folks to do insane things and bribe them for money. He would get these folks to jump out of airplanes. He would get them to jump off of buildings, to eat insects, to do all types of things, to do uh, things in containers full of blood and get them to pick out dead animal parts with their teeth. He would get these folks to do all types of things. It was called fear factor. Well, I want to tell you that the devil is doing the same thing to some Christians. Having them bend over backwards, doing all kinds of things out of fear and not out of faith. Mm. Mm -hmm. But that does not mean that we should go in the other extreme, that we should be too casual and too comfortable that God's going to provide for us, that we become lazy. That we just sit on our bed all day long and do nothing. The Bible's not saying that either. Actually, it says if a man doesn't work, he should not eat. So there is a balance to this gospel. And the second bad fear factor is afraid to serve God. And I believe the root of this type of fear comes from Satan. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6, 7 and 8... It says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by putting on my hands, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Now I put this section of the Bible in bold for a reason because this is the one Bible verse, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7, that a lot of folks will take out of context. They say God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And it says, Be not thou ashamed of their testimony of the Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions. Now to be afflicted means people are attacking you, demons are attacking you. And when it says God did not give us a spirit of fear, it's saying that God does not want us to be afraid to be persecuted for sharing our testimony. It's saying that God does not want us to be afraid to use our gift that He gave us in fear of rejection of people. This is the now a lot of people they will uh, erase the top part, verse six, and they'll erase eight, and they'll just say God didn't give us the spirit of fear and call all fear evil and bad. But it's not talking about all fear. If you take the verse before, the exact verse, and the verse before, it's like a sandwich. It's a complete point. And it's specifically talking about not being afraid to serve God. And evidence is verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of their testimony of the Lord, nor of me a prisoner, but thou partaker of afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. And then in verse 6 it says, stir up the gift. So you're going to have a lot of people say, oh, um, all fear is evil. You're going to hear, people are going to come to you. And if they're coming to you and they're saying that to you, it's probably because they're taking the word of God to suit their convenient lifestyle. And it's probably sinful. Don't be afraid to stir up the gift of God in you. Let the Holy Ghost catch your soul on Holy Ghost fire. The Bible says the, the, the righteous are as bold as a lion. 
It's beautiful how the Old Testament complements the New Testament and the New Testament complement the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 verses 20 it says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him thou shalt serve. Him thou shalt serve. So see, you can see right here in the Old Testament, it's putting fear and serving God together in the same verse. And the third bad fear factor, afraid people will hurt you or harm you. This is a negative fear. Anytime we're afraid and we're scared and fearful that other people are going to do harmful things to us or other people that are going to hurt us, that is an evil fear, and that specific fear did not come from God. In fact, that comes from Satan. Satan will remind God's children of the past things that other people did to us, whether it be physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, financial. In Matthew's chapter 10, verses 28, it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Now, I don't want to emphasize on the last part of it, but I want to emphasize on the first part of it, that fearing people will kill you, or feeling people are going to rob you with a gun, or attack you, or rape you, or abuse you, or beat you. No, God doesn't want us to fear any of those things. God wants us to and treat Him like a father. Fathers will watch over their children. If anything comes that's a threat to their child, they will attack it. Well, the Bible says the exact same thing. That it would be better to tie a milestone around someone's neck than to hurt, harm, or offend one of God's little ones. So we need to hold on to that Bible verse and not walk in fear, that type of fear. Because I'm going to tell you, people who walk in this type of fear, they feel the need that they have to defend themselves at all times. They feel the need that they have to buy a thousand machine guns, a thousand uh, grenades and rocket launchers and security systems and hire security guards and hire people to watch, them, watch around them and they have a thousand deadbolts on their door and they're tormented, so afraid that people will come and get them. Not trusting that God has all angels right. to move mountains, to split the Red Sea, yeah. to destroy the biggest, baddest person at any time. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, when you know that God's watching out and God has angels watching around you, you walk more confidently. You don't have to be afraid. In fact, I'm going to tell you this. There was a time for fun. I went to a shooting range with another Christian friend, right? And yes, I had some bullseyes. And someone, and I actually rented a gun from the gun shop. And while I was shooting, someone said, that's a nice gun you have. I said, this is not my gun. I don't own a gun. I said, this is a gun that I rented from the shooting range for fun. Right, right. For fun. And they said, well, what do you carry then? I said, thank you for asking me. I carry the Holy Bible. Yeah. I carry Jesus Christ. I carry the Holy Spirit. I carry angels that watch over me. I'm going to tell you that I don't have to worry about carrying guns on me because I have God. And this ain't an anti-gun message. I believe people should have the right to carry guns. But I'm saying that our protection does not come in guns. A gun can misfire, backfire, and you shoot it, try to kill someone, and shoot you dead. They could take your gun and shoot you with it. There's no protection... Let me say this. There's no true protection right. outside of God. If you get in God, you're in the safest place no matter where in the world you are. There's safety in the Lord. So this is what the Bible verse is talking about. Don't fear people who could kill your body. Amen. Fear God. Uh, number four, bad fear factor. 
is afraid to love people. This is a doozy. Satan will remind us of past hurts and try to trick us into not forgiving people. And let me tell you this. If we're afraid to love people, it's often because of unforgiveness. Let me tell you this. When I first became a Christian and I started forgiving folks and I knew that God forgave me, I literally went from being Hitler to Barney. I went from hating, wanting to kill and destroy to I love you, you love me, we're a happy family. I literally, turn, I, God transformed me. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 7, it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Now this is another section of the Bible that a lot of professing Christians really take out of context. And they misuse the Bible verse and they combine it with that other one. It says there is no fear in love. There's no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment and those who fear are not made perfect in love. But this Bible verse is talking about us loving other people. It's talking about us loving other people. In the beginning it says, let us love one another. It's not saying that fear, all fear. It's not saying that all fear is evil. It's saying being afraid to love other people is evil. Mm -hmm. Specifically, a specific fear, not all fear in general, a specific afraid to love other people. Right. That's evil. And that if we have the love of God living inside of us, we won't be afraid to love one another. This is why it's, it completes it. It says uh, in 19, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother, hates his brother. So it's not saying all fear is bad. It's saying specifically, if you're afraid of people, you'll often hate them. You can't do both. You can't be afraid of people and love them at the same time. The two don't go together. If you're afraid of them, you'll often hate them. If you're not afraid of them, you'll have the ability to love them. Case in point, there was a time that I was in prison and there was a specific inmate that was known for beating people up. And he would tell them to go behind the wall and that would be the place where he would give it to them. And it wasn't the love of God. He would literally beat them up. The biggest, baddest person in the specific prison. And people were afraid of him. And because they were afraid of him, they could not love him. But God told me to single him out after we prayed for about a couple weeks. A bunch of us got together and we prayed. We made a homemade pizza. And God told me to give the pizza to that man that was knocking people out. And I said, but God. Are you sure you wanted to give it to that person? And God said, yes. So then I told the folks, the Christian folks in the prison who God said to give the pizza to, and they said, okay, if God told you to give it to him, then you give it to him. And I gave it to him. I, I went over, I'm telling you, this man was like a silver brat gorilla. I didn't even look him in the eyes. At least he'd tear my head off. I went over, I looked away from him like this. I said, here, sir, I don't know if you're a Christian. I gave him the pizza. I said, God, put it on my heart to give this to you. I didn't even look, I'm honest, I didn't look him in the eye. I handed him the pizza. And I quickly walked away from him. And I was praying, God, please protect me. Wow. I didn't even look. He didn't say thank you. He didn't say nothing to me. The next day, he called me behind the wall to speak to me in private. I said, no, sir, we could talk right here in public. He said, I need to speak to you behind the wall. I was petrified. And I went over there and I just trusted the Lord. And I went behind the wall. And this big bad man in prison 
He put his hand on my shoulder and he said, I want to let you know that I know that that pizza was from God. My mom's dying of cancer and it's eating me up and I don't know how to handle it. And when you gave me that pizza, let me know that God still loved me and he still cared me. And this man literally wept on my shoulder, started crying. The power of God just rained down, just me and him. And he started crying. I said, do you mind if I pray for you? And he said, please pray for me. And I prayed for him right there and then. I don't know if the man was an atheist, a Muslim. I don't know what he was. But the point is this, that if we're afraid of other people, we won't be able to love them. Next time folks say, uh, with, all, with God there's love. There's no fear in love. And if you say that God loves you and you love God, there's no fear. Fear is evil. And you say, what does the Bible verse say before that? And what does the Bible verse say after that? It talks about hating your brother. Number five. This is a good fear factor. Now we're getting in to the fear that God wants the body of Christ to have. This is the good fear. Fear God and obey Him. Fear God and obey Him. Now, in Psalms chapter 112, verses 1, it says, Praise ye the Lord, blessed is the man. Look at this. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. So the Bible is calling us blessed when we fear God. We're blessed. And that delights greatly in His commandments. Now, a, a, a revelation that God showed me about these commandments is that these commandments are not just talking about the Ten Commandments. It's talking about the written Word of God, both New and Old Testament. It's talking about the prophetic spoken Word of God when God uses another people, another person, to command us in a direction that God wants us to go to. And it's talking about personal commandments when God will speak to our conscience, both by thought and in our heart, the still small voice. So when we fear God, it will follow suit that we will obey God. Fearing God equals obeying God. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 13, it says, Yet because the wicked. So any person who ever tells you you're doing something out of fear of God, you say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. That's correct. And look at what the Bible says in chapter 8, verse 13. It says, yet because the wicked do not, the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them and their days will not be lengthened like a shadow. A shadow just is like instantly. It's there and gone quickly. So folks who do not fear God will often make foolish choices because they don't, because they don't fear God. They'll make decisions based on fearing people, places, and things. Or even afraid of the devil. The devil, doesn't want, the devil wants us to fear him. Okay, number six, a good fear factor. Fearing God draws us closer to Jesus. This should always be the bottom line, is to draw closer to Jesus. In Luke chapter 23, verses 40, it says, But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Does not thou fear God? seeing thou art in the same condemnation. Now here you have two folks on the cross. And in the center of these two folks on the cross was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have one person who's asking the other person who are both in the same situation. One is asking Jesus Christ to remember him. The other is mocking Jesus Christ. The one who is mocking Jesus Christ is the one who does not fear God. And let me tell you this. Regardless of what people say with their mouth, if people tell you that it's bad to fear God, it's bad to fear Jesus, bad to fear God, those are often going to be the folks that attack the things of God. 
just like this person right here. He says, don't you fear God. And the folks that don't fear God are the ones who are under condemnation because God has given them over to a reprobate mind so that they can no longer be tormented by demons. God actually lets go of them. And those are the folks who don't fear God. They're free to sin without torment. They're free to disobey God. They're free to go wherever they want, do whatever they want, whatever their flesh loves, whatever the demons love. And then what happens is there is a demonic process of evil and they'll go deeper and deeper and deeper away from God. And in Jude chapter 1, verses 23, it says, And others save. Now when it talks about save, it's talking about being saved spiritually from hell. Being saved from it. Born again. Escaping the, escaping the damnation. And others saved with fear. Now when it says others that are saved with fear, that means not Everyone is saved with fear. The Bible verse either before that or after that says that some are drawn close to God by His loving tender kindness. But how many know the same method doesn't work for everyone? Some folks are a little bit more hard-headed like myself. And the more tender kindness that God does for me, the more I'm going to take advantage of Him. Until God chastened me and interrupted my happy life. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by flesh. So here you have a good fear factor. Fearing the Lord, it draws us closer to Jesus. Number seven, and the final good fear factor. Repentance that leads to salvation. And this comes from a Bible verse that explains that not all repentance leads to salvation because it says Judas repented. But it wasn't a repentance that led to salvation. It was a repentance that led him to hang himself. Because had he really repented, he would not have had to have hung himself. He could have lived in God like we can. In Psalms chapter 147, verse 11, the Lord takes pleasure. And this should be the goal of all folks. That we should want the Lord to take pleasure in us. The Lord takes pleasure in them that fear Him. In those that hope in His mercy. So here you have an immediate connection between fearing God... And hoping in His mercy. And then you have 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But the worldly sorrow brings death. So there are folks that when they get caught for their crimes, they repent that they got caught. And then there are folks that when they uh, get caught for their crimes, they repent under such a conviction that it causes them to cry out to God and ask God to help them and ask God to save them and ask God to deliver them and ask God to change their life. And that is the godly sorrow that leads to Praise repentance. God. Praise God. So you have folks that... are going to avoid fearing God and they will be in condemnation and then you have folks who will fear God which will yes. deliver us from condemnation. Open the floodgates of heaven Let it rain Let it rain Open the floodgates of heaven Let it rain. Let it rain. Open the floodgates of heaven. Let it rain. Let it rain. Open the floodgates of heaven. Let it rain. Let it rain. Open the floodgates of heaven. Let it rain. Let it rain. Open the floodgates of heaven. Let it r
Yes. Let it rain. Open the floodgates of heaven. Let